Hello and welcome to Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Massa. In this video, I wish to discuss with you uh, more uh, climate news. And I'm going to start off with this story. The warming pause isn't over. It never began. You might have, you probably have heard from climate change deniers, well, there was this hiatus, there was, you know, there was no further increase in global warming, so you guys, you climate scientists are all full of it, and you're just making stuff up, and so on and so forth, and they try to use that as an example that uh, there's no such thing as uh, climate change due to global warming. Well, scientists now think the global uh, climate hiatus never started anyway. Just weeks after one group of scientists officially declared an end to the global warming pause, the so-called hiatus, another group has returned to the argument, and they argue that there never was a pause in the global warming. There was instead a global misperception that warming slowed between 1998 and 2012, but only because of gaps in the data, particularly from the Arctic, the fastest warming region of the planet. Okay. We recalculated the average global temperatures from 98 to, uh, to 2012 and found that the rate of global warming had continued to rise at 0.112 degrees C per decade instead of slowing down to 0.05 degrees C per decade, as previously thought. This is a statement by Jindong Zhang of the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Full disclosure, I worked at this institution. The people there are excellent scientists. They do excellent work. He and colleagues report in the journal Nature Climate Change that the new estimates suggest that the Arctic had warmed by more than six times the global average during the first dozen or so years of this century. The argument about the apparent slowdown in the rate of increase in global warming, that warming slow but never stop, provides a case study of science in action. Yes, we have the data, and you know how you you know, and oftentimes you know the data isn't like oh we measured you know it's not straightforward. It's a very complicated uh, system, and uh, and we're looking at really subtle subtle changes. So, and this happens a lot. Scientists will go back to data sets from years ago and reanalyze them, apply a different technique or a, a more improved technique, a more improved numerical analysis method, and, and so forth. And scientists, you know, the data is data, but the interpretation is what often leads to these lively debates. And let me tell you, uh, the debates can get to be rather lively. But it's, it's interesting to note because what they're basically saying is that we've been able to fill in some of the missing data from the Arctic and we've now been able to show that the hiatus never happened. That is in essence what uh, Dr. Zhang is saying here. Um, but he also, this study also reinforces the idea that global warming is most severe or the greatest effect in the Arctic region. So. How would they, what did they do to recalculate? Okay, the Fairbanks team used temperature data from the University of Washington's International Arctic Buoy Program and newly corrected sea surface temperatures from the U.S. government's NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Also, by placing more instruments out there, you know, in the field, you helped improve the data set, it's like everything else. You know, you get more information, you're able to refine. So really what this is, is simply a refinement. Until the last few years, researchers had not thought changes in the Arctic, and in November 2016, Arctic temperatures were 20 degrees C above the normal for the time of year. So, until the last few years, they had not thought changes in the Arctic would be huge enough to influence average global temperatures. 
And now we're seeing these huge swings. And the same thing happened uh, this year. You know, temperatures in the Arctic are you know, considerably above normal. In fact, here in Fairbanks, the last two winters, I have not recorded a single day temperatures hitting 40 below. 40 below used to be a, a, a constant here. Sometimes you get that uh, Siberian high that slides over uh, Alaska in the Yukon Territory, and you got three weeks of 50 below. You wait for that high pressure system to erode. It's not happening anymore. In fact, over the past five winters here at my house, I have recorded exactly 23 days where temperatures reach 40 below or colder. 17 of those were from five winters ago. As I said, the last two winters, no, it never reached 40 below. Sure, there were times it was like 34, 36 below, but not 40. And really, it's because we had, what, a La Nina year, so that La Nina tends to have leave cooler conditions for Alaska. So things are definitely hopping, as they say. Professor Zhang basically says, the Arctic is remote only in terms of physical distance. In terms of science, it's close to every one of us. It's a necessary part of the equation, and the answer affects us all. Continuing along with warming stories, by air, land, and sea, global warming rises. Global warming took surface temperatures in 2017 to near record levels, while the upper oceans reached their hottest known level. 2017 was a La Nina year, which is why it didn't get hotter. Okay. 2017 was the warmest year on record for the global oceans. Now, this is huge, given the specific heat difference between air and water. You've heard me mention specific heat before. Specific heat is the capacity, capability of a substance to absorb heat and then release heat. So if I have a volume of air here, and I have the same volume of water here, and I apply the exact same heat amount to both, and I place a thermometer in them, the air will heat up much faster. The water, not so fast. Okay. At the same token, I remove the heat source, the air cools down much faster than does the water. The water retains the heat. Think of if you live near the coast, okay, you have the cooling ocean breezes during the daytime and then the warming ocean breezes at nighttime. If you're in the middle of a continent, it may get blazing hot during the day and then quick and it gets down to like in the 30s overnight. Okay. Think of the amount of energy is required to heat up water versus air. The, the definition well, of the calorie, we don't use the calorie anymore, we use more of uh, joules and, and so forth. But in the, uh, just to give you a handle, a calorie used to be defined as the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius, or one kilogram of water one degree Celsius, if you want to talk about a kilocalorie. Is that we use more joules these days. So, since it takes a lot more heat to raise the same volume of water, the same temperature difference as it does the air, think of all that energy that's in the ocean system now. That energy then does what? It turns on and drives storms like Sandy, Harvey. We had, what, four Cat 5 hurricanes this past winter, uh, past, past summer, past hurricane season? And scientists actually wanted to create a Category 6 because of the winds were sustained at over 180 miles per hour. There's a lot of energy stored up in the waters now and it's driving these storms. Sure, one storm does not prove, you know, but when you have a, a bunch of them, there's something going on. So you have all this stored up heat energy and it has to go somewhere. You have these storms. But also, not only have the, the water layers being very 
upper layers being hot and hotter than usual. There's a couple other things that are going on with this. You heat up the air, all right, so now you're melting glaciers. We're not talking sea ice. Sea ice is, you know, sea water that freezes with brine rejection. We're talking about melting of land-based glaciers that, in, that inputs into the ocean. That rises sea level. But also, just thermal expansion itself of the sea will cause sea levels to rise. So sea levels are rising from two factors, melting glaciers and thermal expansion from all the extra added heat. But the added heat does yet another insidious thing. And when you heat up the upper layers of the water, you create differences in density of the water. And that may prevent certain layers of the water from mixing. If you cannot mix, you cannot bring nutrients into the upper regions of the water layers, the photic zone, and insufficient nutrients will hamper what the phytoplankton can do. And if the phytoplankton are not able to photosynthesize and engage in primary productivity, guess what happens to the food chain in the food web? It kind of collapses. So there's a whole bunch of ramifications from all of this. And all of it is really not very good. So we see that uh, report. The news that the oceans are continuing to warm to, uh, becomes an updated ocean analysis from the Institute of Atmospheric Physics and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Science. It, its study was published in Advances in Atmospheric Sciences. Okay. The authors say that in 2017, the oceans in the upper 2,000 meter layer of water were warmer than the second warmest year, 2015, and above the 1981 to 2010 climatological reference period. 2,000 meters, that's over 6,000 foot depth. Like 6,600 feet down. That's well out of the photic zone, by the way. That's going to change the structure of the uh, ocean water itself. Structure in terms of looking at density curves. I'll be doing a video of talking about uh, water mixing. Generally speaking, in fresh water, temperature is the sole factor in determining water density. And fresh water is most dense at 4 degrees C. And then as it proceeds to cool down to 0 degrees C, where ice is forming, it's less dense, which is why ice floats. In the ocean, however, density of seawater is determined not just only by temperature, but also by its salt content, which we call salinity. And in chemistry, there's the principle of freezing point depression, namely that as you add solutes to a, a, a solution, that the solutes interfere with the water molecules trying to create an ice structure, but basically the point of it is that adding solutes lowers the temperature at which water can freeze, which is why if you have oceanic water at zero degrees C, it's liquid. It's not frozen yet. Depending on the salinity, the more salt, the lower the temperature goes down before it can freeze. Uh, sea water doesn't freeze to about, oh, minus three, minus four C, uh, roughly, just to give you an idea. And on the flip side of it, with solutes added to the, to the solvent, to the solution, uh, you have what's called boiling point elevation. It takes a higher temperature for, just, for water to boil off. As I said, there'll be a video upcoming on that. Uh, look, look for that. Here we go again with heat capacity. Thanks to the large heat capacity, the oceans absorb warming caused by human activities, and more than 90% of the Earth's extra heat from global warming is absorbed by the ocean. So, so far the oceans have been saving our bacon. They've been absorbing 90% of what we've been emitting. Well, they can only uh, absorb so much before we start seeing some significant uh, differences and changes, and it's now happening. The IAP, Institute of Atmospheric uh, Physics, says the last five years have been the five warmest years in the oceans. As the long-term warming trend driven by human activities continues unabated. 
and I just mentioned this, the rise in ocean heat in 2017 occurred in most regions of the world. Increases in ocean temperature cause the volume of seawater to expand. That's the thermal expansion I just mentioned, which of course contributes to the uh, global average sea level rise, which in 2017 amounted to 1.7 millimeters. 1.7 millimeters, you're probably going to say, well, that's a yawn. Well, let's consider the surface area of the planet. 1.7 millimeters is not insignificant. Okay. So for the oceans, the five warmest years on record have all occurred since 2010. Now, several of those years were affected by El Nino, which is a periodic natural phenomenon in the Pacific, which can cause uh, cycles to occur helps to boost temperatures worldwide. 2017, however, was not an El Nino year. It was a La Nina year. So La Nina is typically supposed to be a cooling event or conditions are a little cooler, and yet the oceans still continue to increase in warmth. Continuing on with warming stories. Global warming gathers pace. The world is getting hotter. Okay? We have three separate studies that uh, point to this. Global surface temperatures during the three years from 2014 to 20, 2016, each hotter than the last, boosted the total level of global warming since 1900 by 25%. A second study has con also confirmed that heat extremes have outpaced the global average. Maximum temperatures during the hottest heat waves have in the last 30 years risen three times faster, especially in crowded cities, where more than 10 million folks can be found, than average temperatures as a whole. In other words, even the extreme temperatures are higher than what is typical. In a third study, unless the world's nations start to reduce carbon emission, Within the next 17 or 18 years, planetary temperatures will be at least 1.5 degrees C above the world average for most of human history. 35 to 41 years from now, these temperatures will have climbed 2 degrees above the level held before the Industrial Revolution and the start of using fossil fuels as an energy source. Scientists report more news in the Journal of Geophysical Research Letters that between 1990 and 2013, the planet's overall average annual temperature had climbed by 0.9 degrees Celsius. In the three years that followed, it jumped an, an additional 0.24 degrees C. Okay, so let's think about it. It took 23 years to increase 0.9 degrees C and only three years to increase another 0.25 degrees C. In other words, it's outpacing the previous 23 years. That's basically what this is telling us. The sudden temperature rise was matched by heat waves with more extreme maximum temperatures, as I just told you about. Floods, droughts, global uh, coral bleaching, you've heard me discuss that before, and extensive melting of polar ice during those three years. The cyclic climate phenomenon called El Nino, which technically should be called ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, that's more accurate because you have El Nino then followed by La Nina and so forth, it's called ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's the more accurate term for that. Does contribute, but is not the sole cause, nor the majority of the signal that we are seeing. Okay? What is that meant by that? Let's say you run a regression analysis. And let's say you run against one independent variable and you then look at your R square value. The R square values basically tells you how well the data fits the predicted regression line. And let's say you have an R square value of 0 0.79. R squared values range from 0 to 1. 0 is, you know, he got nothing there, it's completely garbage. 
One is a perfect fit. Every single uh, data point it lies exactly on the line. Okay. So we have 0 0.79. All right, that's okay. That's not bad, it could be better. Now let's say you add a second variable into the same analysis. And this is, this is a common thing. You want to try to, uh, to create the simplest model possible to explain whatever it is you're studying. There are some who like to start with the most complicated, then remove variables. Others like to start with the simplest and then add variables. I am of the latter kind. When I've, whenever I've done my analyses, I like to start with the simplest and then add the layers of complexity as needed. So, let's say you add the second variable and now you find your R square is a 0 0.94. Hey, that's pretty good. So what is that telling us? That is telling us that these two variables are explaining 94% of the variation of the data that we are seeing. That's what that's telling us. So, yes, El Nino is contributing, but it's not the major factor. In other words, if you were to look at its individual R square, if you will, it'd be less than 0.5. So that, that's kind of what they're stating there. So, uh, Professor Jianjun Yin, a geoscientist at the University of Arizona, states that our research shows global warming is accelerating. This goes back to what I just mentioned, that 23 years it took the temperatures increased 0.9 degrees, and three years 0.25. That's outpacing the previous 23 years. So yes, global warming is accelerating. A second team report in the journal Earth's Future. They looked at the hottest day of the year data from 8,848 land surface weather stations around the world over 50 years. The highest temperatures rose by 0 0.19 degrees C per decade over the five decades. Over the last 30 years, they rose by almost 0.25 degrees C per decade. Extreme heat readings in Paris, Moscow, Tokyo, other cities rose by as much as 0 0.6 degrees C per decade during those years. One heat extreme in 2003 claimed 70,000 lives in Europe. Another in Russia in 2010 killed nearly 55,000. I don't know if you remember hearing about those heat waves back then, but it was severe and many, many people died. We were talking about 125,000 people lost their lives. Our question now is, will this acceleration continue into the future? And Simon Michael Papalegu, a civil engineer at the University of California, Irvine, put forth this question. He was the lead researcher in this uh, Earth's Futures report. In another study in Nature Geoscience, British and Australian scientists report they calculated the pattern of temperature rises and if the if immediate action is not immediate action is not taken to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, human do not I'm not going to be around much longer. It's basically what they're saying. They're kind of really ringing the alarm bell here. Without cuts in fossil fuel consumption, the planet will be at that temperature within 18 years. What is that temperature? That temperature was the ideal limit set at the Paris conference in 2015 of 1.5 degrees C. In other words, let's try and withhold the warming to no more than 1.5 degrees C. Well, Things aren't really changing. We're, humans are continuing carrying on as they are, and we're going to be there very shortly. The study is important in providing a narrower window of how much carbon we may emit before reaching the 1.5 C or 2 degrees warming. So said Rick Williams, professor of ocean sciences at Liverpool University in the UK. There is real need to take action now, he concludes. And in one more article to share with you about warming trends, 2017 among the three warmest years recorded. The World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, 
says 2017 is among the three warmest years recorded with human well-being facing mounting risks. So the report from the World Meteorological Organization, which is the UN system's leading agency on weather, climate, water, and so forth, has published this 2017 report on the state of the global climate. And uh, I've ha I actually had a chance to look through a lot of this and uh, kind of depressing. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very sobering uh, to read since 1980, the report says, the overall risk of heat-related illness or death has climbed steadily, with around 30% of the world's people now living in climatic conditions where extreme heat persists for several days and sometimes for weeks each year. Between 2000 and 2016, the number of vulnerable people exposed to heat waves increased by about 125 million. Now, at what I discussed previously about humidity effects and uh, many, many more people are at increased risk at, uh, at dying, basically. And when you start increasing the temperature, it also does what? It creates wonderful incubating uh, environments for uh, disease organisms such as cholera. And as it turns out, in places where cholera is endemic, uh, this in, puts people even more at risk for severe illnesses or death. The report continues to say that many people being forced from their homes by climate-related disasters. And the WMO report says that while 2017 has been a cooler year than the record-setting 2016, well, 2017 was a La Nina year, 2016 was an El Nino year, it is very likely to prove one of the three warmest years on record period, and the warmest not influenced by an El Nino event. El Nino events tend to increase global temperature when they occur because of the associated ocean warming in the tropical Pacific and the subsequent heat released into the atmosphere, latent heat energy, basically. A good way to think of latent heat energy is look at an open uh, river in uh, wintertime, and you see that little misty uh, layer right above it. Uh, that's the heat that's in the water, that specific heat I've been talking about. That's the latent heat energy being released into the air. And then it condenses and you get a fog-like effect. The five-year global average temperature from 2013 to 2017 is currently close to 1 degree C, above the average for 1880 to 1900, and is likely to be the highest five-year average on record. A, a, um, the typical technique that's done is you run uh, running averages. So you, look, you calculate the average from years 1 through 5, then 2 to 6, 3 to 7, and so on. Or you can go from 1 to 10, 2 to 11, and so on. And you, you just calculate running averages to look for uh, trends as well. It's a commonly used technique. The cryosphere. Cryosphere refers to uh, the areas of the Earth covered by ice and snow. It also includes the permafrost uh, uh, regions as well. Continues to contract. Ice and snow continue to contract. Ice is melting, snow is re reducing, the permafrost uh, layers are thawing out, it all is contracting. And in particular, in, you guessed it, the Arctic, where sea ice extent continues to shrink. And Arctic sea ice extent started shrinking last year after some years of stability or even slight expansion. And as I just mentioned, permafrost is thawing is increasing as well. Professor John Turner, a climatologist at the British Antarctic Survey, or BAS, states, Antarctic sea ice continues to surprise us with only 40 years of data. We have to be careful about attributing this change to a specific cause. However, projections from a number of climate models all agree that Antarctic sea ice is likely to decline significantly throughout the 21st century. Decline significantly significantly throughout the 21st century. Climate change and its consequences are with us now. We are imperfectly adapted to the climate system we have created, and much less so to the one we are provoking. 
The report records many significant weather and climate events in 2017, including a very active North Atlantic hurricane season. Well, that's an understatement. Major monsoon floods in South Asia and continuing severe droughts in part of East Africa. In September 2017, alone three major and devastating hurricanes that made landfall in rapid succession in the southern U.S. and several Caribbean islands broke modern records for such weather extreme and associated loss and damage. Global average temperatures for the period from January to September 2017 was almost half a degree C higher above the 1981 to 2010 average. Continuing global warm means that 2015, 2016, 2017 are now the three warmest years on record. 2014 was the fourth warmest in four or five data sets considered. Chris Rapley, a professor of climate science at UCL, states that weather via sea level rises, ocean heat content, extreme heat waves, droughts, floods, melting ice, shifting ecosystem or displaced people, the planet is sending increasingly strong warning, warnings. So there you have it. We are affecting the planet. We have the data that's backing us up. There really is no doubt about that. So now the question comes down to what do we do about it? And this is where do we have the wills of politicians to initiate policy changes, to put money into further research into not only effects of what's happening climate-wise, but into renewable, sustainable, alternate energy forms? What happens next? There are some who already think we passed the tipping point. If not, we're darn close to it, and something needs to happen to address this soon. Otherwise, all of human civilization is at risk. And when you displace people, you put strains on other regions, on their resources, and stuff like that, this is what can lead to wars. So humans need to do something and act quickly. That brings me to the end of this video. Um, I thank you for watching. Kind of a sobering one, but that this is what's going on. I'm bringing to you the reports that you're not going to see pretty much anywhere else. Please go to patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa. Please uh, subscribe, become a subscriber to support my work. If you're already a subscriber, thank you for your continued support. And as always, please tell others of the work that is done here. Thank you for your time.